The year is 1996, and Tupac is at the top of his career. He's a platinum-selling artist, already had a number one album, and was destined to do big things further on in his career. In February of 1996, we all know that Pac would release his most successful album ever, which would be All Eyes On Me. All Eyes On Me would debut at number one on the Billboard 200, selling 566,000 copies in its first week, becoming Tupac's second number one album on the chart at the time. When people talk about Tupac, they predominantly talk about this album, and I mean, it's a phenomenal album. It's arguably the best album in his discography, but there's another album that to some can rival that, and that's the Don Caluminati, The 7 Day Theory. But before I get more into the video, I would first like to thank you guys for coming to see this, because you guys can be doing a million other things right now. But instead, you're here with me and I appreciate that. If you guys like the content, you guys should like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel grow. Also, follow my Instagram too. That would be greatly appreciated. Comment down below your favorite song from this album, favorite verse, lyric, etc. Let me know your top five favorite songs on this album. Also, let me know where you are tuning in from as well. Represent where you are from. All right, without further ado, let's get into the video. So many of us already know that Tupac would tragically pass away in September of 1996. The Don Caluminati, The Seven Day Theory would be released less than two months after his death. Many people know that this album exists, but they don't know the story behind it or why it was released under the alias Machiavelli. Fans of Tupac already know how much he was into reading, but while he was in prison, he started reading the teachings of a political philosopher named Niccolo Machiavelli. Here's what Tupac had to say about Machiavelli. I find any great man, black or white, I'm going to study him, learn him, so he can't be great to me no more. That's what I did with Machiavelli. It's not like I idolize this one guy, Machiavelli. I idolize that type of thinking where you do whatever is going to make you achieve your goal. It should also be noted that Tupac would quote Machiavelli from time to time. And one of the instances I can remember is when Tupac talks about how fear is stronger than love. Here's the actual quote from Machiavelli. And here comes in the question whether it is better to be loved rather than feared or feared rather than loved. It might perhaps be answered that we should wish to be both. But since love and fear can hardly exist together, if we must choose between them, it is far safer to be feared than loved. So now you see how Tupac was inspired by the works of Machiavelli. But there is one thing in Machiavelli's teachings that has sparked rumors about Tupac's death. In the book Art of War, Machiavelli developed a strategy for one to fake their own death in order to deceive their enemies, which people have claimed Pac did himself, but I don't want to get into all that nonsense in the conspiracy theories. If you want to know more about Machiavelli or Tupac's connection to Machiavelli, for the time being, I'll put a link in the description to some articles if you want to learn more. Also, something to note is that in the liner notes of the Don Caluminati, it says, Exit Tupac, Enter Machiavelli. Member of the Outlaws, Idi Amin, has talked about the new names for Pac and the rest of the Outlaw members. And he said that they were picked on purpose because, and I quote, they were people that we know this country despises because we feel like as young black men, we are despised in this country. So we're going to take it a step further and put it even more in their face. Please excuse me if I butcher some of these names, but remember Yaki Gaddafi was a reference to Myanmar Gaddafi, Idi Amin being a reference to the former president of Uganda, Idi Amin. And we know what Machiavelli represents to Tupac. And those are only some of the names I broke down. But back to the album and the recording sessions of this album reportedly took place over seven days in August of 1996 while Tupac was filming Gang Related. The lyrics were reportedly written and recorded in only three days and the mixing took an additional four days. Over 20 tracks were recorded during the sessions for this album, but 12 ended up making the cut. However, though, there was some dispute on if the album was actually made in seven days 
due to different things, including Tupac's schedule and rumors that Tupac wasn't entirely satisfied with the initial track list, songs, and other features for the album until the album was finalized in mid-August of 1996. I think that a good bulk of the album was done in seven days, but for instance, like To Live and Die in LA was recorded in July along with the video being done in July. But back to the thing about there being over 20 tracks that were recorded during the sessions for this album, and we know the album we have today has 12 songs, but originally there were supposed to be 7 more but were cut for unknown reasons. Much of this other scrap material ended up on various posthumous works and you can find it online. I'll put a link to a few articles talking about this lost slash found material down in the description if you want to learn more. I'll also send a link to a website talking about Machiavelli, The Three Day Theory, which is a demo version of the Don Columinati, The Seven Day Theory. Right now on the screen, we have a different version of the tracklist for the album we have today. You will see that Against All Odds isn't the last track. F Friends and Watch Your Mouth didn't end up on the commercial album. Both of those songs were disses at Tupac's rivals, by the way. Toss It Up isn't on here along with Just Like Daddy and Life of an Outlaw. I forgot to mention that Lost Souls didn't make the final album but does appear on the gang related soundtrack. All the stuff about the original track list can be found on YouTube so I don't want to go too deep into that because we have other things to talk about. This album on the production side didn't have Johnny J who frequently worked with Tupac, didn't have Dr. Dre for obvious reasons. Daz Dillinger, etc. I don't think that people realize the true scope of how many Tupac songs Johnny J produced, both released and unreleased. Definitely unreleased. I mean, just for instance, on All Eyes on Me alone, Johnny J originally had 15 songs, but it got cut down to 11. Johnny was having trouble with getting paid by death row because we would see in January of 1997, Johnny filed a lawsuit against death row records and Interscope records for allegedly failing to pay him for 11 songs he produced and co-wrote on All Eyes On Me. Johnny J claimed that Suge Knight promised to pay him a $10,000 advance per song that he produced for that album against a royalty of 3%. So this is a big reason why Johnny J probably didn't produce for the Don Columinati album. Another thing about the production for this album is that Idi Amin said Tupac was looking for a whole new sound. Tupac never really went into the studio and complained if a certain producer wasn't there. Death Row used to have this room that they called the Whack Room because people said Ain't nothing but wax stuff came out of there. Death Row had a stacked list of in-house producers, so by no means were these people not talented in that room. Tupac didn't care that they were in the wax room. Idi Amin has said Tupac's attitude was that he could make things happen with just about anybody as long as they knew how to work the machines and didn't care who it was. Also, Idi Amin and some others have said that Tupac wanted to initially drop this album as a mixtape and do what 50 Cent went on to do years later by flooding the streets with mixtapes. But also, the Doc Illuminati album didn't have the star-studded cast that was on All Eyes On Me, and some people can make conclusions on why Tupac predominantly had close associates like the Outlaws on most of the album besides himself. Two weeks before Tupac's death though, he did an interview with Vibe magazine and this is what he had to say about his upcoming album at the time. I'm at a point where I'm in charge. I don't have to answer to anybody. I'm in total control. I've got another album dropping next month under an alias name under Machiavelli. It's called Columinati. I'm not the king, I'm not the teacher, or nothing like that, but I feel like I don't have no peers. I've been out less than a year convicted of allegations that usually end dudes' careers. Shot five times in the nuts and the head. I came out and in less than an effing year, I was sold Biggie almost three times. I sold more records than his whole effing record label. I think this quote from Tupac gives us an insight into his mindset at the time. Pac was in pure attack mode and we would soon learn that when the Doc Columinati dropped, that yeah, pure attack mode. But when asked if Tupac was motivated by revenge towards his enemies at the time, this is what he had to say. Now it's for fun. 
This new Machiavelli album I got coming out, I'm taking on dudes. It's like my dopest album ever. It's 12 tracks. I talk about my shooting in New York. I say the names of the dudes that shot me, the names of the dudes that set me up. Everything I couldn't say, I said it in a rap. I also diss Dre, I diss Mob Deep, all them dudes, Jay-Z, Puffy, Biggie. My album cover is me on the cross being crucified, and the cross is the map. It's got New York, Harlem, Brooklyn, everything, and I'm on the cross being crucified for keeping it real. I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but for some people I have to add some context and people like forget that this was in the middle of the East versus West feud. And in that feud, we all know that Tupac was going at Biggie and Bad Boy really crazy along with other artists. In the second half of the video where I break down the tracks of the album, we will see more insight into that particular topic. As we pretty much all know, Tupac would get shot on September 7th of 1996 and die six days later. The first single for the Don Columinati, which was Toss It Up, was released just less than a few weeks after his murder. The music video for Toss It Up would be the last music video Tupac ever did, and he was so late to the video shoot that they almost thought about canceling it altogether. Shortly after the shoot, he left for Las Vegas, and the rest is history. When it comes to the Don Columinati album, it was actually supposed to come out sometime in 1997, but due to Tupac's death, it was moved up. Now we'll talk about the name of the album, and the official name is the Don Columinati, The Seven Day Theory, but it was originally supposed to be called Columinati, The Seven Day Theory. But to break down the name of the album, Pac wanted his new rap alias to be Machiavelli The Don. I guess someone messed up and separated the phrase Machiavelli The Don, Columinati, The Seven Day Theory. They singled out Machiavelli as the name of the artist and put a colon between the Don Columinati and the Seven Day Theory. So somebody probably messed that up, but that should clear up some confusion of why Don is in the album name because Don is a part of Machiavelli The Don, which is the name Tupac wanted it to be released under. Now the phrase Columinati is a play on the phrase Illuminati, but with the K in front of it. I think most people at this point know what the Illuminati is or was or whatever, you know what I mean? So I don't want to go too deep into that whole secret society thing, but it's an easy Google or YouTube search away to find out more info. But the K in Columinati is for kill and put it together and you get kill Illuminati. And I'm about to play you a clip of Tupac explaining this. How you doing? That's why I put the K to it. Right. I wanted, the niggas is telling me about this Illuminati shit while I'm in jail, right? Like, the dollars, you know? Right, 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 right. That's another way to keep yourself in steam, That's gotcha. another way yeah. to keep you unconfident. Right. And I'm putting the K because I'm killing that Illuminati shit. Uh, Trust me. These I hope that solves that portion of the album name in the Seven Day Theory. It's pretty self-explanatory with, you know, what I said earlier about the album and all that stuff. Now, the cover art of the album is something that has an interesting story as well. The artwork was done by a man named Ronald Risky Brent, and he actually is from the same neighborhood as Suge Knight in Compton. He was already known around his neighborhood because of his drawings at the Compton swap meet, and he used to airbrush t-shirts. Risky also used to rap and actually tried to reach out to Suge on some rap stuff, but that didn't really work out. One day, a girl Risky knew named Gina took his art book to Suge Knight. Suge ended up liking his drawings and told Gina he wanted to meet up with Risky. This meeting never happened, but one day, Risky went to the Compton Swap Meet and they were filming the California Love Remix video. Tupac, Suge, and a bunch of other people were there filming. At this time, so many people wanted to talk to Suge, so Risky had to wait. But he eventually approached Suge, and Suge remembered his artwork. He introduced him to Tupac. Tupac and Suge would go through the art book, and Tupac would see that Risky drew a picture of Biggie. And obviously at this time, Tupac didn't like that. But they got past that, and Tupac originally wanted Risky to do something for his song with Snoop, two of America's most wanted, but nothing came of it. Risky ended up doing the painting of the inside of Tupac's All Eyes On Me. The artist who did the Death Row logo, Hand Dog, gave Risky a pencil sketch and concept for the painting and Risky did the rest. When he handed over the artwork, the credits for the album had already been turned in. 
so he didn't get credit in the liner notes for that painting. When Risky found out how much he was getting paid for it, he put F it as kind of a secret code to identify it as his painting. Now I say all this to say that around mid-August of 1996, Suge Knight's brother-in-law called Risky into his office to tell him about a new assignment. This is what he had to say about it in an interview. He told me from the jump that it's going to be something crazy. Apparently, Suge and Tupac had a meeting and wanted me to paint Tupac on the cross for the album cover. The concept was all Tupac's. Norris said I needed to have a mock-up ready that evening for a death row staff meeting with Suge at Gladstones. I thought about it a bit, found a painting of Jesus Christ, and cut out a picture of Tupac's face from the March 1996 issue of The Source to put on top of it. I showed it to Suge after the meeting and he said that's it get to work. Tupac wasn't at the meeting though because he was filming gang related at the time. A few days later, Risky came to Tupac at Can-Am Studios, which was Death Row's recording studio. Risky brought the unfinished canvas painting with him and the cross hadn't been filled in yet. Tupac asked him if he could make the cross into a roadmap. Tupac told him the cities that he wanted on there, where he wanted them, and that he wanted a compass on top of it to signify east to west. The compass was really important to him according to Risky. Tupac told Risky that he had felt that he had been crucified by certain cities and that he wanted to shout them out. The holes in the map with lights coming through them were Risky's idea. Tupac's body in the background was also all airbrushed. It took a total of about three days to complete but most of the time was taken up by Risky waiting to hear from Tupac. Risky has said that most of his paintings that he did for Death Row took a day or less. Tupac actually saw the finished piece the night before he got shot in Las Vegas. He loved it and told Risky he was going to host a gallery showing off his artwork. Death Row had already given Risky a budget of $5,000 for materials for it. Unfortunately, because Tupac died and Suge went to prison, that never happened, but Tupac also told Risky that he wanted him to do the artwork for his new house in Calabasas and for his penthouse. Risky also did the original back cover for the album and this is what he had to say about it. Yeah, I worked on the back cover for it that was never used. Tupac came up with the concept for that too. I painted Biggie as a pig and Puffy in a tutu. Hen Dog did the drawing of Dr. Dre getting hit from the back by a drag queen. After Pac died, they decided not to include that. Now I'm not gonna put the picture of this cover on the screen. Like, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. You can easily Google and find it. Easily Google and find it. The Doc Illuminati, The Seven Day Theory, would be released in November of 1996 and peaked at number one on the Billboard 200, selling 664,000 copies within its first week. One last thing is that I have to discuss the original liner notes for the album. I'm about to put it on screen and man, it's truly wild. I dedicate this to Jack the Snitch Agnet for ordering the hit, to Tut for shooting me, to Puffy, Big Stretch Lil Sean, Jimmy Henchman, and whoever else remained silent while quietly conspiring my downfall. I thank you. I thank Faith for the greatest weapon ever, her low self-esteem, and beat up Cat. Thanks to Wendy Williams for being fat. Thanks to Mob Deep for opening your mouth and letting me squash your no record selling selves to dust. To Dr. Dre for being in the closet. To Nas for not taking my advice and minding his business. To De La Soul for being mad at me for living well while they live like fat washed up bums. To Donnie Simpson and all the comedians who laughed when I bled. To Jay-Z, King Sun, Doogie Lock, whatever Lil' Kim, or Fat Weave wearing Biggie, short stubby meat sucking Kim for being nobodies. Now it's time to see who's watching too many movies and who's ready to get their cash on for real. Wartime, worldwide, nationwide, citywide, real dudes do real things, exit Tupac, enter Machiavelli. Wow, like you want to talk about everybody catching smoke like yo yo like yo for my fans of the boondocks this reminds me of the wingman episode and mo jackson left a gift for granddad after his death which ended up being nuts and you know he was like these nuts like 
So granddad got pranked from beyond the grave and he couldn't get him back because he was dead. Like, yo, but Tupac, talk about a freaking wow. That was crazy. But all right, let's get to the second part of the video. The album starts off with the track Bomb First, My Second Reply, which features the Outlaws. Tupac's infamous song, Hit Em Up, was his first reply, so Bomb First was his second reply. The song starts off with the fake press release and Tupac is out of the gate dissing his enemies. He was going at Nas and Mob Deep, made fun of Jay-Z for the Hawaiian Sophie thing, and called Biggie the notorious P.I.G., but the whole track is littered with disses toward Tupac's enemies, and something I never knew is that E.D.I. Mean went at Exhibit on this track because Exhibit made a song called Paparazzi, and he was talking about how rappers were only rapping just for money and fame. E.D.I. Mean questions Exhibit's words by asking him why does he rap if it's not to make money. But here's E.D.I. Mean giving more backstory and history behind the track. Machiavelli is an album that Pac basically did on his own. I mean production, lyrics. A lot of people don't know that Pac was a producer. Bomb First was actually a beat he started on. Other people got credit for it, but Pac started that beat. The bass line was from Naughty by Nature's Uptown Anthem. E.D.I. Mean also said that this track was an introduction to Young Noble because he was the last official outlaw. Now we'll go to the second song on the album, which is the most popular song and one of my favorite songs by Tupac, <clears throat> I mean uh, Ma Machiavelli, <laughs> and it's Hail Mary. Tupac told the producer of the track, Hurt Him Bad, that he needed something slow and thuggish. The producer then made the beat for Hail Mary and Pac went crazy. Young Noble's verse was already written and he wrote the last little hook part with the outlaws on a paper chase line. That was going to initially be the hook at first, but Pac wanted to put it towards the end and that's when Pac came up with the iconic hook for the song. Some additional things about the song is that it was actually supposed to end earlier and Hurt wasn't feeling the song at first and E.D.I. Mean wasn't too crazy about the song at first either. The next song is Toss It Up, which features Danny Boy, Aaron Hall, and Casey and Jojo. Here's what E.D.I. Mean had to say about the track. That's a song that was already done. Suge had it done with Danny Boy and Jodeci on it. That's my least favorite song on Machiavelli. Pac just got on the track and did his thing. That was some stuff him and Suge had already worked out. And the crazy part that a lot of people don't know is that that song was originally to Black Street's No Diggity Beat because Dr. Dre had did that No Diggity Beat while he was on Death Row and Suge had it. But then Dre sold that stuff to Teddy Riley. The beginning of those songs were almost exactly alike. I don't know who bit off of who, I ain't here to start no stuff. This is interesting because Danny Boy said that they sang Toss It Up over the same No Diggity track and Blackstreet sent a cease and desist letter to them and stated that they couldn't release it. So that's why the remix, the version that everybody had an opportunity to hear, had a beat change. Denny Boy also said that Toss It Up was really a diss song aimed at Dr. Dre, but also in the track, specifically on the outro, Tupac was going at Teddy Riley, Biggie, Lil' Kim, and Diddy. Also, another fun fact is that Demetrius Ship Sr. is the dad of Demetrius Ship Jr., who went on to play Tupac in the 2017 All Eyes on Me movie, and he has production credits on Toss It Up. You want to talk about a weird coincidence? Like, that is crazy. Like, your dad has production credits on Toss It Up, and then years and years later, you go on to play Tupac? Crazy. The next song on this album is To Live and Die in L.A., E.D.I. Mean has said that this was Tupac's favorite song on the album besides Against All Odds. Tupac really, really, really loved L.A. as we know, so it's no surprise if that's the case. Tupac did the lyrics in about 15 minutes and did it in one take over three tracks. This song is said to be California Love Part 2, basically, and another thing about this song is that Tupac really loved Prince and this song was a reinterpretation of the song Do Me Baby by Prince. The next song on the album is Blasphemy, and if you want to break down the word blasphemy, you get blast for me. But in this song, Tupac really went deep 
and he didn't really realize it until after he recorded the song. The person saying the prayer in the song is Castro's sister, which in tune is Tupac's cousin. Idi Amin also feels like this song was about the outlaws as well because Tupac used to talk to them through his music. Idi Amin has said that the outlaws were out of control back then and Tupac wanted to snap them back into reality. But the deep subject matter in this song was Tupac talking about religion and how he believed in God but he disapproved religion in the form in which it is today. Go check out his Lost Vibe interview to find out more on Tupac's stance on religion because he breaks it down way better than I can. The next song on the album is Life of an Outlaw and Napoleon's grandma had died during the making of the album so he had to leave early. By the time he got back, Tupac had already had a lot of the songs already done except this song which is the only song that he's on. Napoleon would also say if your verse wasn't done before Tupac's, then you weren't on the song. Idi Amin has said that Pac played the melody for this song, but he's not credited for it. The next song on the album is Just Like Daddy, and it features the outlaws. Here's what Idi Amin had to say about this song. Just Like Daddy is a song that was done for the outlaws album. Pac was trying to teach us how to do some stuff for the girls, cause all our stuff was hard stuff. Kill em up stuff, hard times, struggle stuff, why my life like nothing type stuff. Pac was like, that stuff is cool and people going to love y'all for that. But y'all gotta give them something else. You gotta get the girls. Y'all gotta do some other stuff, some lighter stuff. Some stuff people can have fun to. So this dude went up there and we start doing just like daddy. The next song is crazy and the outlaws was supposed to be on that song, but they weren't fast enough like I said earlier, with Tupac wanting verses to be done before his. The next song on the album is White Man's World and Idi Amin had this to say. It's a personal record. I think it's like an open letter to his mother and his sister. He's like writing from jail. He's really just apologizing for a lot of stuff. At 25, we're all trying to grow up and change and figure out stuff. A lot of people don't remember that dude was only 25. That's still a kid, really. 25 is a really young, immature age, but at the same time, he had the responsibility of a 40-year-old. He had the responsibility of a whole family, a whole label. At that point in the game, Death Row was on Pac's shoulders and he knew it. The next song on the album is Me and My Girlfriend, and this is a metaphorical song where Tupac refers to his gun as his girlfriend using personification as a figure of speech. Young Noble has explained that the main inspiration for the song was the Nas song, I Gave You Power, where he raps from the perspective of a gun. The hook for this song was also used for Jay-Z and Beyonce's song, 03 Bonnie and Clyde. There's some history behind that track as well, because according to a Def Jam a &R at the time, they only had one day to clear the Tupac sample that was used in that song. They were back and forth with the Phoenix Shakur, who, for those who don't know, is Tupac's mom, and they were back and forth with her all day until they got clearance. To me, it is just so weird when you think about it, and Pac got the concept from Nas, and then Jay-Z samples Tupac's concept of Nas. Like, to me, it, it's just... It's just super weird, and it just gets weirder when you realize the liner notes that I said earlier, and even the distance towards Jay-Z and Nas at that on the Dark Illuminati, super weird, super duper 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 weird. Okay, so cut from the original audio, and Tupac actually saw Nas at the MTV Awards, which took place on September 4th of 1996, which was a couple days before Tupac would be shot. In days after that, Tupac was to come to his injuries. But Tupac told Nas that he was going to take his distance towards him off of the album and told Nas to meet up with him in Las Vegas. But alright, let's get back to the original audio. Also, the girl at the beginning of Me and My Girlfriend who provided vocals to personify Pac's gun goes by Virginia Slim and she was the former receptionist at Death Row Records. The second to last song on the album is Hold Your Head, and Pac already did the verse and the hook by the time he met up with Hurt Em Bad. Tupac 
wanted her to sing the hook, and this song was also dedicated to all the jailhouses, political prisoners, etc. The last song on the album is Against All Odds, and the subject matter of this song really lives up to the name. The day the song was made, Tupac said he needed a war song because he wanted to go to war. Heard him bad, cooked up the beat in an hour, and came back and played it for Tupac. Pac wanted Hurt to add the bass line from the cameo song, Skin I'm In. Hurt also said while Pac was doing his vocals, he wasn't just recording his vocals. He was also kicking over the music stand and hitting the microphone. But Pac was speaking his mind on the track. He said that this was the truest stuff that he'd ever spoke. He went at pretty much everyone on the original liner notes of the album, and in the third verse of the song, Tupac raps about how he'll probably be murdered for the stuff that he said. And we know that he would get murdered before the song ever came out. But some wonder what would have happened if he never died in Vegas and what would have been the repercussions for Pac if this song or even album came out while he was still alive. And this is also taking into account if Tupac never got shot in Vegas at all because like it has been proven that even if Pac lived after being shot in Vegas, that he would have never still been the same because of his injuries. And this scenario is not taken into account if the East-West situation didn't improve for the better or various other different scenarios occurring before this album's initial release. This track is really sad though because it was like Tupac going out guns blazing in a ball of fire and he really felt like he was against all odds. This will conclude the video for today. I hope you guys enjoy and I'm really sorry for taking this long to make a video on Tupac. I had friends hitting me up like how you gonna have a channel predominantly about rap and not have a video on Tupac? Yo, people was giving me hell man but... <laughs> But comment down below and let me know what you thought about this album. Let me know if you learned something new. I don't really even like have to explain why this album is a classic. If you know, you know. Peace, I'm out.